the only way that we could take on competitors 10 times our size was to go out about it a different way. From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff. When I dug into the background of today's guest, it honestly didn't seem possible for one engineer to lead that many diverse initiatives at so many groundbreaking companies, but (laughs) here we are. We're joined today by Mark Papermaster, AMD's CTO and Executive Vice President of Technology and Engineering. And believe me when I say you've never seen someone with this level of engineering experience. He led iPod and iPhone hardware teams under Steve Jobs, made waves at IBM developing PowerPC, led Cisco's Silicon Engineering Group, and at AMD was the force behind AMD's Zen technology and a ton of other tech that we'll dig into today. Mark. Thanks for being here and welcome to the lobby. I'm curious, was engineering something you always wanted to do? No, I had uh, I had no idea what engineering was actually all about. <laughs> and uh, and I was just very fortunate in that I grew up in a house where uh, asking a lot of questions and problem solving was the de facto standard because uh, my dad was a cancer researcher. He uh, did research. He also taught at universities. And so the dinnertime conversation was always about trying to figure things out. And he was a, a early researcher in immunology, which is now, you know, such a, an exciting a way in which cancer is fought and actually many, many successes. But it was actually just beginning back then. So it was uh, just really exciting dinner conversations and other people would come over, other professors would come over. And I just saw that dialogue, that banter and that questioning. Well, why does it work that way? You know, how can we solve that problem? That part, I didn't realize at the time, actually, Daniel, that's a statement of me looking back many years later at the time. I just thought, well, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, interesting conversation. But it led me to learn to just always ask questions. And uh, and then, of course, I became a tinker and you know, took apart watches and all those other, you hear other stories of uh, folks that are engineers. And, you know, it really comes back to common stories when they're growing up is something sparked them to want to solve problems. And uh, I'm certainly as fortunate uh, uh, to have had that in my background as well. Can you tell me a little bit about your time at Texas, uh, University of Texas, and as an A&M engineering grad, could you maybe break down why A&M's school might be uh, (laughs) a... (laughs) <laughs> how those stack up. Daniel, they're both great schools. And, uh, and, and you know, I have so many uh, f- friends from, from so all the universities. But in Texas, I love that, um, you know, for years, particularly back when I went to uh, University of Texas, it was such a rivalry with Texas A&M. It's still, still there today. Uh, but it turns out they're both fantastic engineering schools. And uh, my days at, uh, at UT, I uh, was very fortunate because uh, it was such a time of change. And Uh, Austin at the time uh, was a hotbed of semiconductors because there was Semitech and, you know, semiconductor research that was uh, coming into Austin. Uh, You had uh, IBM and Motorola that were uh, early in Austin. And so that was the early days of microprocessor. You know, here I am dating myself, but it it was. It was the early days of microprocessor. It turns out uh, as I went to school in engineering and, and chose engineering because I had uh, actually, um, as a, in, in college, had interned for an electrical engineer at the University of Texas Medical Branch, which is in my hometown of Galveston. And I and I said, "Wow, that this is really a problem-solving major." So I showed up at UT, and and uh, you know I had a counselor, and they said, "What do you want to do uh, in electrical engineering?" I said, "Oh, there's choices," <laughs> and they said, "Yes, there's so many things you can do. You actually are, are going to have to pick your junior senior year. Where do you want to focus?" And so I, I didn't know, and, and I tried to take a broader electrical engineering curriculum. And I look back, Daniel, I'm so glad I did because uh, I learned a lot of the fundamentals. I mean, of course, every engineer takes the requisite, uh, you know, math and physics and chemistry. Uh, but then because I wasn't so sure what I wanted to do, I did take a lot of control theory, but I took uh, introduction to microprocessors and, you know, did logic design. I learned about circuits. Uh, so, uh, in a way, uh, being a, a kid from a smaller town coming into, you know, this huge University of Texas, 
it, it was a challenge because I had to I had to go up against those uh, big city kids that that were probably much better prepared than I was <laughs> to enter uh, the tough engineering school. Uh, but I learned you had to work hard uh, for uh, what you want to achieve, and and I and I had a broad curriculum uh, that prepared me to uh, go wide in my career. So it was it was just a a great setup, and uh, and still uh, very involved with the University of Texas today. I'm I sit on the advisory board there. How have you seen tech change both in Austin and globally from when you graduated until now? Yeah, I think I've seen some fundamental shifts. So when I uh, go back to when I started my career, there was very much an idea of uh, hiring people for specific disciplines they're in. So let's go solve this problem. Well, what do we need? Well, let's get electrical engineers over this problem. That, um, and then you know they'll complete their work, and then there'll be a separate set of engineers that might write the code and and the barriers between someone writing the code and and creating the hardware in which that code was run uh, back in the day were pretty high, right? Uh, They were, you know, the way um, uh, both academia went about uh, training people and the way that uh, industry uh, would would run in uh, deploying uh, product development uh, was more isolated in the skills. And what I've seen over the, the years I've been in industry is all those lines have blurred. (laughs) <laughs> because now, uh, really, what happens is products are done um, with collaboration across multiple disciplines, and and very div- you know the best products come with diverse groups. Of course, you need that specialized training, uh, but you you want uh, people really thinking about what is the solution, what's the end experience, whatever it is. I could be doing a, a gaming application, I could be doing uh, an AI application, it could be. Uh, an industrial automation. It's all about what, 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 again, I go back to what I said earlier, what problem am I trying to solve? What experience am I trying to create? And now it's really gone about in a multidisciplinary uh, approach. And that's, that's pretty exciting. As an engineer, would it be better to be a generalist that can specialize or a specialist that can generalize? Well, I always uh, am a believer that you, you have to decide what your core strength is What's your core strength of of your own aptitude, and what do you what do you love to do? Because when you pick what you want to do in life, it, if if uh, if you're fortunate and you can have a long life, um, you know you're going to be doing it for quite a while. So first and foremost, you better make sure you have a passion <laughs> for what you're doing. Uh, so I put that as the as the fundamental. And once you have a passion, I then recommend get that solid expertise in one area. I think some people start going broad too early. Uh, I did have a broad education, but then what did I do when I uh, started work? You know, I interned. Uh, I had the opportunity to co-op, and so I did a couple different co-ops. I did one co-op on space shuttle programs uh, with uh, IBM, the prime contractor doing the computers for NASA, and then I stayed with IBM and I did an, an, a, a third uh, co-op term doing semiconductor development. And it was that it was it, that opportunity said ah that that clicked for me. I said that's that's what I want to do, and so I created a a, a solid base uh, in terms of semiconductor industry. And, and I, I in fact got my master's and specialized in in some of the uh, areas around uh, semiconductor physics and circuit design and 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 uh, chip design. Uh, that served me very well and I recommend it to others. Pick an area you have a passion for, it clicks for you, develop an expertise, and from that then just have a thirst for learning and and grow and 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 go wide from that solid base that gives you that confidence to know that you're contributing, to know you can, you know, you can really uh, create things and solve big problems. Speaking of building things and solving big problems, how did you end up at AMD? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, AMD, I had always seen uh, from a distance, they uh, they had a presence in Austin uh, when even you know even going way back <laughs> to when I was in uh, uh, undergrad uh, here in Austin, and uh, I always saw it to be such a uh, you know an innovative company. But I d- actually never thought, uh, Daniel, that I would I would be here, and, and I was more on creating uh, chips and and companies that created the end product. So if you think about what I was doing at at IBM at uh, at Apple at Cisco, it was all about uh, getting technology out into uh, computers, all the way up to supercomputers. At at Apple, I ran iPhone and uh, and iPod, you know, and so it was all about getting that technology and and implementing, the, you know, a, a, just a wow customer experience. 
and at Cisco uh, providing some of the best uh, networking and routing in, in solutions to really allow the internet uh, to hum and to allow people to, to run their global operations. And so I, I was uh, uh, just fine uh, going in, on that path. And I uh, got a call from uh, Nick D'Onofrio. Nick had been the head of engineering at, at IBM uh, of the uh, many years I was there, and he had retired and was on the board of AMD. And he said, Mark, uh, you know, I really want you to look at uh, coming to AMD. And uh, I said, look, I have tremendous respect for AMD, such an innovator. But uh, at the time, it looked to me like AMD had lost its way. It was uh, just, had, uh, you know, was falling off on some of the competitive vectors. And he said, uh, look, all, your fears are true, uh, but the team here is incredible. And, you know, it, it could be the opportunity of a lifetime for you to influence the industry. And he said, if you don't uh, do it, I may need to come out of retirement and, uh, and do the, take the role myself. It's such an exciting role. And uh, Nick had been such a mentor to me <laughs> over the years. I, I, almost, I felt, my God, I really have to look at this. And sure enough, it was the opportunity of a lifetime because, again, AMD had this storied history of innovation. And it uh, you know, had just such great technologists. And I had the opportunity to be both CTO, so to head the direction of the company, and run technology and engineering. So uh, that type of a dual hat role to help guide the vision and then work with the engineers on that actual product introduction uh, was a phenomenal opportunity. It's been over 10 years, and I've just, it's been uh, truly uh, you know, the most exciting years of, of my life because of uh, the impact the team has been able to have. It's, it's been truly phenomenal. Uh, you know, again, people have written AMD off, and now it's, it's just uh, such a force on, on the industry. It's truly exciting. We'll be back in just a moment with Mark Papermaster, CTO of AMD. Today's sponsor is extra special to me because it's Keysight, a lovely place where I spend most of my days playing with test gear. Keysight is sponsoring this episode because as of right now, you can sign up for the Keysight Live from the Lab event. This is an event I run, so you'll see me over there. And as part of that event, I'm giving away over $100,000 worth of pro-grade test gear. If you like this podcast, you're going to love this event. Hit pause and go sign up at keysight.com slash find slash lobby. We're bringing in some video creators like Electroboom and The Signal Path and a couple others, as well as a ton of technology experts. I'll tell you more about that later because I'm out of time, but right now go sign up and you know what? I'll even give you an extra entry if you use the link keysight.com slash find slash lobby. And we're back with Mark Papermaster. Mark, when you joined AMD, I hear you caused quite a shakeup. You're on the record saying that the architecture they were pursuing, quote, threatened the very existence of the company. And you triggered a redesign of the Zen architecture. What did it take to make that tough call and what was its impact on AMD? Yeah, and it, it, uh, it's a great question, Dan. It goes right to you know, the challenge that we faced uh, when you go back uh, you know, 10, 11 years ago. And that was uh, what I said earlier, there was a competitive challenge. And a company like uh, AMD, you, you build up a set of products, but it's built on a foundation. The foundation had always been innovation-driven computing leadership at the base. And w we needed an, a new approach to get back there. You go back in, in that point in time, ARM was coming up in mobile devices. Uh, it, uh, you know, the, our x86 competitor had, uh, you know, very strong high-performance devices and, and a strong roadmap. And so it was clear it would take a, a radical approach. And so uh, we rallied the team and I had to make changes. Uh, so I did bring in uh, new leadership, but it was about changing the goal and setting the aspirations. It wasn't, it wasn't about going and getting a new team. Uh, for instance, uh, Mike Clark, Mike was the architect of, of the Zenfang. He came up with the name Zen. And Mike uh, is, has been a, you know, a lifelong AMD leader, grew up through the ranks of AMD microprocessor engineering. And, he, you know, he takes it personal. And so, you know, with the right uh, leadership, the right guidance of where we are going. And, and frankly, I had to make the call that uh, we would protect that investment at all costs. So although it was tough times in the company, uh, we protected the investment around CPU and, and Zen uh, at the expense of other areas in the company. 
And um, Mike and team delivered, not, not, not just Zen, not just a first instance, but a whole family of, of leadership, high performance x86 processors. It's a story, uh, Daniel, about people more than anything else. What, what sort of impact does it have when people feel personally invested? So you said Mike takes it personally. How much is that an asset and how much is something like that a liability? Uh, it, it's only an asset and it really defines AMD. We're the scrappy guy. We're like about a tenth the size of <laughs> our big uh, competitors. Uh, it, it really defines the culture at AMD. And um, it, it's a can-do attitude. And it just, it's a work hard, uh, but but play hard. We want to we, we want to <laughs> make sure, uh, you know, uh, people have some balance. Uh, but it, it's a culture of, of uh, accountability. And, and that's what you want. You want to work with people that also care. You know, how deflating is that if you come in and you got, you know, you're bright eyed and you, oh, my God, I want to have an impact in the industry. I just graduated college or I just finished my graduate degree. Or I, I come in. You, you want to make a difference and you want the people you work with to feel that same excitement. And uh, that's what we have at AMD. It's really been, uh, I'd say, fundamental. And Lisa Sue is, is, took over and CEO as CEO in 2014. Uh, has just done a phenomenal job just rallying the company around that culture of innovation and uh, getting products, great products out uh, that matter to our customers. What sort of role does a modular design approach play as you're trying to get new products out the door? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, a broken record on that. Those who have been with me in my tenure at AMD know that uh, from the moment I arrived, I've, I've been uh, preaching modularity and it, and it just seemed, it, it actually sounds boring, you know, when you say, oh my God, you know, why is this person talking about modularity? <laughs> uh, but it turns out uh, that modularity is, is such a critical facet of scale. Uh, and it, by the way, it goes back to our, the history of engineering innovation. Look at, you know, Ford's assembly line and the thinking about, you know, if you could uh, get reusable components. And, and, and if you look at how the auto uh, industry evolved, uh, subsystems, major subsystems be reused across different automotive lines. And, and look at uh, how uh, that drove uh, leadership in the U.S. Uh, automotive in industry. And I had um, my own uh, personal influence there. Uh, was uh, the last role I had at uh, IBM uh, before uh, taking the role at, uh, at Apple on iPhone and iPod was running a modular computer system. It's a, it was a, a called a Blade architecture. I think many of the listeners are familiar with the uh, Blade servers. And it allows you to modularly grow your system uh, and, and scale out. So add computing uh, in a very, very uh, straightforward way. Uh, the hardware and software accommodate that growth. So you you think multidisciplinary in terms of uh, how you put together these modular solutions. When you look at what we face, Daniel, from a turnaround standpoint 10 years ago, uh, the only way that we could take on competitors 10 times our size was to go out at, about it a different way. Uh, and so we really drove modularity. Uh, we, we are a company that had been uh, made of a traditional legacy AMD, but also acquisition of ATI graphics. And so we went about uh, creating what we uh, call the infinity architecture. So all the pieces could play together. Uh, and that allowed us to, uh, in a much more facile way, for instance, think about the uh, the laptop I'm joining your, your podcast today through. It has a, an AMD APU. So it's a CPU and a GPU all on one chip. But the way that's done is uh, leveraging the Infinity architecture in a very modular way. So the same CPU, GPU, memory and I.O. Uh, uh, controllers I have, our, our FIs, our, our interfaces to all our connectivity, uh, those elements that we use to create that chip for this notebook that I'm talking to you on, many of those are reused all the way up to building the same chips uh, that we use for supercomputers. And so that gave us, as a smaller company, uh, a competitive weapon, an ability to, uh, you know, using a boxing analogy, you know, punch above our weight. How do chiplets play in with the concept of modularity? Yeah, chiplet is another aspect of why modularity was was critical for us. Uh, we saw this trend of of chiplets coming, and you know, ties right into the title of your podcast. I mean, what we saw was that Moore's law was going to have to change. I mean, Moore's law was about monolithic dies and, and really uh, shrinking at each generation uh, to be able to double that density of uh, the number of transistors every 
uh, 12 and became really, you know, 18, 18 months uh, in uh, cycle. And uh, because, uh, and I'm sure you've had many speakers on your podcast uh, uh, talk about, uh, you know, Moore's Law slowing, meaning traditional Moore's Law. You don't get as much out of each semiconductor new node as you used to, to boost your performance, but keep that uh, semiconductor device at the same power level. Uh, we still have tremendous advances of each semiconductor uh, node, but it's typically more expensive, uh, and you you don't get that same uh, improvement of, infre- of frequency at the same power that you used to. Uh, you are still getting the packing density. And so because it's different, it uh, really drove the need for more innovation to keep us on the same pace of computing increases generation over generation. Because although... Uh, you know, it's becoming tougher and tougher at each new semiconductor uh, technology node to get that same benefit. That didn't slow the pace of computing demand. It's insatiable and and it's accelerated. Uh, and we're, we're going to see even more acceleration as AI becomes prevalent everywhere in everything we do and every device that we uh, interface with. And so that's where triplets come to bear because it turns out, and we've been, we were a, a leader at, uh, at AMD on on driving heterogeneous compute. It goes back, as I said earlier, to that acquisition of ATI. The folks and the leaders at AMD before I got here had prescience. They saw this coming. Uh, they brought CPU and uh, GPU together. And uh, and it really is about using the right compute engine for uh, the tasks that you have. And we just completed uh, acquisition of Xilinx. It adds more heterogeneity, more options uh, for how to uh, create a diverse uh, computing engines, the right engine uh, for the right task. And uh, that is a very, very exciting uh, future for, for computing going forward. You already combine a CPU and a GPU with the Xilinx acquisition. Will we see an FPGA thrown in the mix too? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that uh, building on the, the chiplet question you had just a second ago. So the thing uh, about chiplets are um, it allows you uh, in in the implementation uh, to have more flexibility, if you if you architected modularly, which we have, uh, so you can uh, partition uh, the circuits out uh, to each of the uh, you know each of the the key computing engines. So uh, general purpose CPU, a GPU for vector acceleration, and likewise, uh, when you think about uh, what uh, Xilinx brings, of course, already partitioned to bring programmable arrays. So uh, AI is a great example. The algorithms are constantly changing. You know, as soon as you put out what you think is the the best, uh, brawniest uh, AI acceleration chip, there's there's an algorithm that really wants a different hardware optimization, uh, and the FPGAs allow that. And what Xilinx has just done a phenomenal job of mixing that programmability with fixed function accelerators. So mixing uh, hardened circuits with those programmable circuits, and uh, with uh, chiplet partitioning that we, we've been. Uh, already uh, been shipping multi-die solutions uh, for many years. We had uh, stacked high bandwidth memories that we first went out with in 2015. Uh, our first Epic uh, you know, computer was four chiplets that went out in 2017. And then in 2019, uh, we had mixed even technology nodes. We, we architected the um, CPU separately from the IO and memory die uh, in, in two different process nodes. So when you think about how FPGAs and, uh, you know, in AI acceleration or for in industrial automation or right in the dentist, in data center to uh, speed your networking, they want to be close to the CPU. They want to be close to other accelerators. And we have the opportunity with chiplets when they need to be uh, to package them and achieve efficiencies uh, in computing density and power dissipation. You don't always have a solution that wants everything to be combined. So we'll continue to offer uh, the standalone CPU, GPU, uh, and uh, and Xilinx products. But the most demanding applications want to be optimized, and chiplets uh, give us that venue. And uh, you know, you've, you've heard the, you know, some people quote that the packaging will be the new motherboard. And so if you if your methodology and your design approach allows you to implement your key functions in chiplets then you give customers the ability to mix and match, just like we've done for generations on the motherboard, yet do it in a highly efficient way. Almost all in one package instead of one board. Getting getting those functions in a single package instead of a board, that's exactly correct. Are there interesting differences between designing chiplets versus traditional IC processor design? Yeah, it puts a premium as you design in chiplets 
on really uh, managing the partitioning of function uh, and the movement, the movement of data. And so you really have to uh, architect what uh, wants to be close, what can afford latency, what can afford delay uh, between those uh, compute elements. And so I, I've been at this so many years. And so th there's a phrase I always use, use whenever you're uh, developing a computing solution, it needs to be a balanced solution. Y if you just focus on the compute engines and don't worry about how do you get to memory, how do you bring memory in close, you don't think about I.O., you don't manage the latencies, you don't think about the software stack, how, you know, what are the key uh, uh, elements uh, in the software stack so that you provide a, a balanced computer for the compute engines, you'll often uh, find in, in histories littered with devices that were fantastic on a very uh, narrow uh, focus of optimization, but weren't that balanced computer that uh, that you know that software could run well on. And so that's that's the focus with template engineering is not losing what served us well in this industry of always thinking about the end solution and how do you not only have the compute elements uh, but uh, managing your movement of data uh, very very efficiently. That makes makes a lot of sense. I, I've seen some of the timing diagram challenges on, on our chip design team. And I imagine having multiple dies makes that incredibly more complicated. <laughs> it, it does. And, and I talked about multidisciplinary. So it's that architecture side. It's equally, Daniel, the physical side. So when you bring that much computing together, think about the thermal engineering to make sure that uh, as you're packing those chiplets, uh, that you can uh, dissipate the energy. And it, 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 it's not just a mechanical engineering job because you're actually going to have to have control circuits on each of those chiplets that are managing hotspots. They're managing, you know, where uh, you're allowing, you know, the um, density to not exceed the thermal limits. So, again, another example of the, the multidisciplinary approach that's required uh, in today's world. You've worked with some famous, incredible engineers over your time at AMD, including well-known designers like Jim Keller. What makes a great chip designer and what makes a great AMD chip designer? You know, they, I, I think it's really the, the creativity side, <laughs> the innovation side. I mean, you need, you need when, you, when you build a team, you need, I, I go back to that, the diversity word, <laughs> you know, th people think diversity, well, it's all, you know, diversity about ethnicity or it, it might be gender. Uh, and those are very important because you want uh, that diversity to bring different backgrounds uh, in, into your mix as you drive creativity. Uh, but uh, diversity is also what kind of engineers are you bringing in? Are you bringing in someone that's, uh, you know, just a narrow expert? Are you bringing someone that's got, uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, that broad background? Are you bringing someone in that's provocative that might actually cause some debate and argument? Uh, and and you have someone that you pair with that person uh, that can, uh, after the storm, the creative storm develops, that can uh, ensure that, uh, you know, calmness prevails and decisions are made and everyone moves forward as a team. And so, you know, that's what I focused on and in, in, uh, in creating the teams, you know, AMD, such a rich history of innovation. But uh, honestly, uh, to the engineering leadership, I did bring some provocation, some challenge, and and uh, and and uh, some of the early uh, leaders I hired. Jim, Jim was I I had known Jim many years in the industry, and uh, so creative and also provocative, really challenging people, and uh, and so you know he he was a part of the story at AMD, um, but uh, but even more so was about that complement of skills that that we assembled that that made sure we had diversity in thinking and and had all the tough debates. But we land on a decision, we move forward as a team. Sit tight, we'll be back in 60 seconds with Mark Papermaster. Like Slim Shady, I am back again. That's right, this whole episode is sponsored by Keysight. Like I mentioned earlier, if you like this podcast, do yourself a favor and go check out the Keysight Live from the Lab event. In addition to the $100,000 of test gear we're giving away, we've lined up a ton of engineering experts for hands-on sessions you might like to see, like characterizing active devices with a VNA and running DDR5 conformance tests on 50 gigahertz oscilloscopes and a lot more. Go sign up at keysight.com com slash find slash lobby like Moore's lobby this event is honestly one of my favorite parts of the year because i get to learn so much see things i've never seen before and give away so many oscilloscopes now they're calling me scopra that's keysight.com slash find slash lobby
And now back to our interview with the CTO of AMD. Mark, while you were at IBM, you had a big influence on the development of PowerPC, the reduced instruction set architecture. Can you tell us what PowerPC is and why it was such an influential initiative? Absolutely. So uh, IBM originated the reduced instruction set approach. Uh, it came out of uh, IBM Research up in Yorktown Heights in New York. And the idea uh, is straightforward, and that is uh, that you could create more efficiency if you reduce the number of instructions and could optimize the execution pipeline for those instructions. And so it meant you would uh, take a, a lot less time in the front end of your processing pipeline uh, and, and quickly get to where uh, you're, you're optimizing uh, uh, through, as I said, the whole front end from uh, you know branch prediction to uh, piping it through your floating point or your uh, uh, fixed execution point uh, pipelines. And uh, the beauty of it was it forced, I'll, I'll call it a uh, wake-up call versus the traditional complex instruction set, which had been mainframe, which I had, uh, of course, grown up with in, <laughs> in IBM, uh, and, and uh, NX86. And what's interesting is in engineers, uh, they do get religious about one approach versus another, but <laughs> data talks in engineering. And yeah. when one approach is superior, it gets adopted, Daniel. And so when you look at the complex instruction sets, which are very long words and get broken down uh, and, and then executed, uh, today they're all basically risk because what you do uh, is you, you, uh, you take those complex instructions, you break them into micro ops, that's what we do at AMD, and then it's like a risk-like engine that we're executing. So uh, everybody, uh, it turns out the difference today between the, the risk and the CISC has been minimized because you very quickly uh, bring yourself into a risk-like pipeline. <laughs> I've heard a lot about Risk Five in the last couple of years, and I've even played with like some FPGA dev boards out there. Can you talk a little bit about the trend in Risk Five from an AMD perspective? Yeah, it's it's a consortia approach, and it, uh, we're certainly supportive of it at AMD uh, because there should be, uh, you know, there should be choice. Uh, across instruction set architecture. We're, we're not religious on instruction set architecture. We have uh, in every uh, chip that we send, uh, uh, you take our CPUs, of course, they're an x86 CPU, but I have microcontrollers on there that'll be from uh, ARM and other vendors. And, you know, it, you, you, know you want the best uh, compute engine for the task. And what RISC-5 uh, is trying to do is really just lower the barrier for innovation around those processors. It'll start really in these microcontrollers. Uh, that's where you'll start seeing the uh, earliest adoption. And it'll take it time uh, to move up the stack, but it will. Uh, it'll just take evolutions and iterations that are designed to have more uh, high performance capabilities. And, uh, and I, I like that there's alternatives uh, uh, that are out there. When RISC-5 RIS is there, and it has a, you know, features we need. And if it's a better alternative, uh, we, we have no, again, we don't have religion here. So uh, we would use it starting in microcontrollers and, and certainly watch its development over time. You know, the industry is, is, is ruthless. It, it wants the, the best solution out there. But instruction set architectures do need an ecosystem. And so it does take time. X86 has a massive ecosystem and, and uh, billions upon billions of lines of codes optimized to it. Uh, and so we are supportive of Risk Five, but it will take time uh, for it to develop uh, a full-blown ecosystem. I'd love to talk about the AIM Alliance. So we have Apple, IBM, and Motorola, it's quite the group. Can you talk about what that group accomplished and were there any concerns around that level of collaboration? Well, uh, bringing three companies together <laughs> is always a, a task, and uh, that was certainly a fun part of my history. I was in the uh, the you know the ground floors that uh, it was started, uh, you know, and in, invited to a nondescript building, and you walk in, and and there are members of uh, I was of course with IBM at the time, and there were leaders from Apple and uh, leaders from Motorola, and uh, you know I had the opportunity to lead the uh, all the physical chip design of the PowerPC 601, the very first uh, PowerPC chip. And it was, um, you know, I talked earlier about how you bring different types of people together to create, um, you know, innovations and breakthroughs. And uh, it, it is tough with the three companies, but uh, I, I think um, what's key is you have a goal alignment. And for the first 
uh, series of uh, PowerPC chips that came out, there was excellent goal alignment of what it is that uh, the three companies were trying to do to shake up the industry and, and create an, an alternative, a risk alternative uh, to the industry. And it was very, very successful. You go back and look at the PowerPC you know, 601, 602, 603, 604, groundbreaking in terms of getting uh, you know, high performance out there, led the way for uh, DEC and others to do what they did. And, and frankly, uh, you know, drove uh, AMD and Intel uh, to respond as well. So competitive races are good for the industry. It drives all of us to, to be our best. And getting three companies together is tough. Uh, keeping It started out goal line, but as you saw, Daniel, that, you know, that, uh, you know, it did have a shelf life uh, because it's hard keeping three companies goal line generation after generation. Just getting two companies, let alone three, <laughs> I imagine is quite a challenge. That's right. <laughs> Obviously, you're quite accomplished in the engineering field, but you're also famous in the legal world. Not many people can claim to have been the center of a landmark legal case. Can you tell me about non-compete clauses and that whole situation? Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I run into it. It's only attorneys I run into that tell me, oh, Mark, you're famous. You're the, you know, you're part of this uh, landmark case. The engineers don't care. Uh, but yes, attorneys uh, all know my name. But it, it's uh, what this was, uh, you know, going back to 2008. And at the time I was uh, uh, running a, a server development, the blade server development I talked about earlier uh, for IBM. And uh, Apple uh, kept knocking on my door. Uh, you know, at the time I had a commitment, I had a generation of uh, products I was getting out and I, I said, look, I'm not interested. Uh, and uh, Steve uh, Jobs started calling me directly and, uh, and I finally agreed to meet him. And what I realized is uh, I didn't know what I didn't know, meaning uh, there was a I was, I was, uh, had had a, a fantastic career at uh, IBM. I felt I'd been able to have, uh, you know, an excellent impact there. But there's areas that uh, I uh, hadn't tapped in terms of where my plethora of skills and I do have an ability to bring people together, uh, you know, uh, warring factions or different opinions. I'm pretty good about getting people to sit down and and really align on, on you know, what does it take to win? What are we trying to do? And I realized in talking to uh, Steve that there was that opportunity at Apple. And it, it didn't compete. And, and I had signed a non-compete, but I was working on server development and I was going to take over uh, iPod and, uh, and iPhone and actually not even the chip design, the actual, uh, you know, uh, phone and, and iPod design. Uh, so to me, it seemed like a great mix. Uh, IBM didn't see it that way. Uh, and, and it led to uh, them uh, fine and non-compete. Uh, but it's not surprising uh, when you think about it, because uh, Apple had dropped IBM as a chip supplier. So there was tensions there. And I think that's what everyone has to realize is, you know, uh, big companies, there's a lot at stake. And so uh, you need to be uh, 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 wary of the landmines. But uh, non-competes, you know, uh, you know, to me, uh, you know, I think I, I, I hopefully the legal committee has learned that it's hard. You have to look at uh, technology. You have to look underneath the covers to really understand uh, what is competition. I mean, the difference between the server designs I was doing and an uh, iPod and iPhone uh, it did not have any conflict of IP. Uh, I, I, and uh, that obviously uh, bore out because uh, you can look back uh, and now you see uh, that IBM and Apple are, are partners. <laughs> <laughs> Friends again. You know what that music means? That means it's our last sponsor message. I honestly don't know what else to say here. If the chance to win a bunch of test gear doesn't convince you, and a whole suite of industry experts making cutting edge measurements on cutting edge equipment doesn't convince you, and interviews with beloved engineering creators like Electroboom and Great Scott and the Signal Path and Curious Mark doesn't convince you, I have nothing left to say. I pull out all the stops for this event and I really think you'll like it. Go sign up at keysight.com slash find slash lobby. If you use that link, I'll give you an extra entry into the giveaway. You can also get some sneak peek behind the scenes shots over on my Twitter at Daniel Bogdanoff and on the Keysight Labs YouTube channel. Go sign up keysight.com slash find slash lobby. We're back with Mark Papermaster. So you led the iPhone and iPod teams. What are your favorite accomplishments from that part of your career? It, it was a, it, it was an interesting time. I mean, for for me, it was just phenomenal personal growth because 
the scale. Uh, this is when um, it was actually a transition. Uh, the iPhone was going through uh, uh, 3GS was just being uh, completed. We had the uh, iPhone 4, uh, which was breaking many barriers across mechanical engineering design with the uh, with the ID. Uh, it was a glass, uh, you know, front and back a CNC a around the entire phone uh, device itself. It had, you know, new features with the camera. It brought FaceTime to bear, uh, a Gorilla Glass, you know, that uh, it meant, uh, you know, close partnership with Corning's, uh, and as well, uh, really pushing uh, with our uh, our partners on the radio and on all the uh, you know, WLAN, WYN uh, connectivity. So it was a phenomenal uh, innovation period of time. And it really epitomized bringing hardware and software together. Because that's what makes a phone. It wasn't really a phone. It was a computer. That's what. Uh, that's why the iPhone was so successful. Uh, is it? You know, was was trying to uh, bring you know an, an interface that was much more capable than any other phone had had to bear. Uh, but uh, you know, such a, a tight integration of hardware, software, and applications. Again, I go back to that end user experience. And if I look at um, what I learned is. It comes right back to the theme I've been on with you, Daniel. It's all about communication. And we had teams moving fast. You know, uh, th those those phones and iPods had to go out on schedule because, uh, you know, that's that's how consumer goods are sold. You, you have to hit the consumer cycles. And so what I learned uh, is uh, where there's challenges, you've really got to bring people together. Uh, be very candid and and, uh, and work through the challenges. And and we did a good job. And, you know, I, I was there a short time, uh, but it was, I think I was able to leave an impact of how teams work together, how they communicated. Uh, and uh, those products uh, did fantastically well in the market. How does it feel to put together a product that is so groundbreaking and then have people get hung up on something like the antenna? Oh, that's going to happen. I mean, it just like... Uh, the focus we we see this anytime you you sell to consumer uh, there's just a, a a tremendous focus and there's press and and so it's very very important uh, to manage uh the perceptions and you look at antenna gate and you know as, as the press called it and what it was is uh you know obviously they, they said there could be some attenuation in single uh, signal based on how you hold the phone which was true for many phones at the time but it, it it took on a life of its own, and it did it did point out areas that could be improved in the iPhone. But this is what happens in consumer products, and it served me well because what I learned at AMD uh, is we serve uh, consumers through what we do in partnership with uh, Sony and and Microsoft with game consoles. We're in PCs. We you know we're you know, we're so strong in uh, graphics. And what I learned is how important it is uh, to manage that that initial perception of the product. And so what we do at AMD uh, is we're testing all of our products uh, like as the consumer would. We're, we've we've uh, brought the experience uh, to be front and center in everything that we do in our designs. And uh, we, we've, uh, uh, if you look at the, the customer satisfaction scores of AMD, they have ridden, risen uh, uh, to uh, very, very uh, high levels, really top levels of, uh, of quality. Uh, and and that's due to our focus on uh, that end customer perception uh, before we ship the very very first product. On that note, how does AMD internally view groups like Linus Tech Tips and Marquez Brownlee? I imagine they can be really helpful or cause kind of a stir for you. They do, and 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 it, and again, it serves the industry well. They're they're tough. Uh, we know they'll be tough on us, and and it goes back to my earlier uh, comment, Daniel. And, uh, that you know, we want to listen to those people. Uh, you know, Linus uh, Tech Tips represents the same opinion that millions of consumers are going to have on on our products. Uh, so we feel that they're the guardians or the protectors of the end consumer. They're uh, you know they're asking the tough questions, and uh, we 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 listen to them. <laughs> and uh, if if there's ever advice they have on our products, uh, we don't uh, we're, we're, uh, we pride ourselves at AMD. We're never going to. Uh, be arrogant to where we don't have our eyes and ears uh, wide open for uh, any feedback on how we can improve our products going forward. And it served us well. Now, I got to ask, you reported directly to Steve Jobs. Is there anything that stands out to you from that time working with him? You know, uh, Steve is, is historic in the industry. And, um, you know, I just say, uh, you know, he, he had uh, all the 
aspects of, of creativity and, and being a demanding leader that uh, is so well known. And there's nothing uh, I'm going to add that may not already be in uh, books and, and movies in, in, uh, in that respect. Uh, but uh, look, I, en- I enjoyed my time at Apple. Uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity working for Steve. And uh, I will tell you, you know, that, um, you know, the biggest takeaway I had is always to set the uh, bar as high as you can and to always be clear on what does it mean in terms of the impact you're having on on the, the end user of the product that you're creating. And that's that's what I took to uh, to AMD and uh, could could not be uh, more proud with, uh, with myself uh, working with our you know, Lisa and the rest of our our uh, technical and managerial leadership here at AMD, what we've been able to do and what we will do. We're, we're just getting started. So what's next? What's next for you? What's next for AMD? What gets you excited? What we're excited about is the breadth that we now have uh, at AMD. So uh, our turnaround started uh, rejuvenating our, our CPU roadmap with uh, the Zen family and then did the same thing uh, with graphics. Uh, so we were on our uh, whereas we're on our, our third generation of Zen, uh, we're on our second generation of our RDNA-based uh, graphics, our uh, Radeon line. Uh, and now with Xilinx, uh, we get a breadth uh, extending into uh, you know, uh, the 5G revolution that, that, that's coming with the, the massive explosion of bandwidth uh, with uh, embedded devices. Embedded devices were very small at AMD. It's a huge market. Uh, as uh, it, with the, the Xilinx has developed, and our combined focus on the data center. When you think about the data center through the edge of the data center, so that's the computing going on in your car, that's computing at at a base station, it's a computing uh, going on, uh, you know, in on the factory floor, managing the, all this mass of data that's being created by the IoT, the Internet of Things devices that are embedded everywhere. Uh, Daniel, it it. You know, here I am 40 years uh, into my career, and it's now an absolute explosion of data creation that needs massive high-performance computing to make sense of it, to make all that data useful. And now at AMD, we have the breadth of portfolio uh, to directly take that on and and provide, uh, you know, high-performance solutions across uh, those markets. So, uh, there, there, you know, I, I uh, will say the the future is bright, uh, and we're poised very, very well to help our customers solve the daunting problem of the explosion of data and putting it to use with you know analytics and and serve their purposes to grow their businesses. We only have a couple minutes left, so I'd like to do a quick lightning round with you. Based on where you see tech is going, are there any skills that you think early career engineers should brush up on to be successful in ten years? Well, uh, you know, the quick answer to that is every uh, engineer today needs to uh, to make sure AI is a part of their skill portfolio. You should really think of it like it was in the day of the tools. What what were the tools you had? You go back, uh, you know, years and years ago, and everyone learned the slide rule, and then you learned your calculator, and you maybe you had a TI fifty nine, you had a really cool calculator. And and then, you know, it was the birth of the PCs in the early 80s, and then it was the spreadsheets. And then didn't matter what you're doing, you better be good at uh, spreadsheets and and being able to crunch the numbers. AI is a tool. It's a tool to analyze data that you have to have uh, going forward in in whatever, uh, you know, engineering and technical discipline you have. And you need to think about it in that that very way, uh, you know, fundamental capability that you should have. If you weren't a doubly industry titan, what job would you have? Well, it probably sounds pretty boring, but uh, I, I loved history. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I, you know, any chance I had for an elective, uh, it was, you know, studying uh, ancient civilizations. And it's just, it's fascinating. And uh, when I get spare time, I am, I, you know, I continue to, uh, you know, read uh, history uh, books and, and learn more. And when I travel, I always like to see uh, historical sites. Uh, so. I, I don't think I would have had to, uh, have had the the chance to impact society with the products I've worked on, uh, which which I found was my true love. Uh, but uh, it, it's okay being a hobby, and I and I'm going to stick with it as a hobby. <laughs> if you had a time machine and could go witness five minutes of history, what five minute chunk would you choose? Oh my God, um, I, I think it would be in the in the in the time of uh, Galileo and when when the world uh, realized 
uh, that there was a vastness out there uh, and and that uh, there was no limit on what we needed to learn as a as a society and it I, I just think it spawned uh, you know what what has now been uh, you know millennium of <laughs> of uh, technology uh, innovations because what was thought to be the world uh, was wrong <laughs> and and was reset and and there was you know expanded view of what we could all do in society. And last question: Is there a, a tech gadget that you either doesn't exist or don't have that you wish you could could hang on to? Uh, it 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 it's what we all want. Uh, it's that's a true immersive experience. I mean, you can look at all the you know buzzwords and it's metaverse and you know and you can get caught up in all that. Uh, but honestly, Daniel, when we have that truly immersive experience uh, where uh, you and I, rather than talking to each other through this two dimensional screen, would feel like we were actually in a room together, uh, and and the uh, graphics capability and the compute capability was such. That uh, you know that it really would fool our senses. We would actually feel like we were together. That is what uh, not not just myself. I think it's what we're all uh, aiming for in the industry, and it's going to be a, a game changer. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been a pleasure, Daniel. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed chatting with you today. And that is it for today. Thanks for joining me in the lobby. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast engine and leave us a review. If you do leave us a review, let us know on the All About Circuits or Moore's Lobby social pages, and we'll send you a Moore's Lobby mug. I'm your host, Daniel Bogdanoff, and I'll catch you next time.